Okay, we're going to get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I'm Margaret Mantor. I work for the department um, in our Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. And um, today's lecture is part of a lecture series that we're doing called the Conservation Lecture Series. We have a website where you can see uh, the schedule of lectures that we've got coming up. You can watch videos of lectures that we've had in the past. And um, you can register for any lectures that we've got coming up. And if you have any questions about the lecture series or about the website, please um, email me. This is just a list of the ones that we've got scheduled in the near future. We're doing a talk on Shasta crayfish tomorrow, uh, desert tortoise in May, and Amargosa vole in June. And some of them are in our regional offices, but if you'd still like to watch those, you can register for them and watch them um, over the internet. So today, um, we're really happy to have Dr. Chris Searcy back giving a lecture on California tiger salamanders. Uh, Chris earned his PhD from UC Davis in population biology, studying the terrestrial habitat use of CTS. He captured tens of thousands of salamanders at Jepson Prairie Reserve to determine the distance they traveled during their annual migrations to and from breeding ponds. He recently completed a postdoctoral research study at UC Davis as well, studying factors that influence CTS breeding, um, CTS population fluctuations and the ecological impact of hybrid CTS. He's currently conducting research at the University of Toronto, and I'm really glad that he is here today. He actually gave the first lecture for this lecture series and agreed to come back all the way from Canada. Um, so thank you so much for coming today. Sure. All right, so the main goal of this talk is to um, discuss those aspects of California tiger salamander ecology that are most relevant to their management as an endangered species. And so I'm going to be providing information about the basic ecology of the salamanders and also have a few suggestions about how I could see that information being used for management. Um, the final management decisions will all be based on decisions by the agencies, but up to this point we've had a lot of success with conversations with the agencies where we provide information and then they try to use that uh, to develop the best possible management practices and we're really hoping to continue that into the future. So uh, first, just so what is the motivation for this talk? This is a list of all of the threatened and endangered salamanders in the United States. And if people saw my talk back in September, you can see that the number of papers here is much higher. That's not really a reflection of this many papers being published in September, but uh, rather that Web of Science has added a lot more sources to their catalog. So more of these are actually publications put out by agencies. But the uh, relative numbers is the same, and the message is still that we know more about California tiger salamanders than any other threatened or endangered salamander in the U.S., and so we should be able to take that information and use it to create the best possible management practices. So a brief outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to give a short summary of the natural history of the California tiger salamander just to put everything else into context. Then I'm going to talk about when CTS are active, so on two different scales. First, what parts of the year they're active in, and then within that, uh, how do they time their individual movements based on weather patterns. Then I'm going to go into where CTS are active, so what parts of the environment. And finally, I'm going to discuss a mesocosm experiment that we finished last spring looking at the community level impacts of hybrid salamanders. All right, so first, the natural history. California tiger salamanders primarily breed in temporary breeding ponds. So this is a photograph of the northern shore of Olcott Lake where I did most of my research. So if you when it's full, Olcott Lake is the largest remaining breeding pond available to tiger salamanders. 
Um, it gets up to 80, uh, 33 hectares. Uh, but if you go out there between July and October, you'll just find a dry pond bed. So uh, as soon as the uh, rains arrive in the fall, the California tiger centimeters, which spend over 95% of their lives underground in burrows, start to come out of the burrow system and migrate down to the pond to breed. So this is a shot from the same vantage point as the previous one showing uh, Olcott Lake now that it is full. And so as the salamanders come down to the pond, they court in the water, and then on average each female lays 800 eggs. And she attaches them either singly or in pairs, as seen here, to either uh, little pieces of vegetation or just directly to the substrate of the bottom of the pond. Each uh, the egg takes two to four weeks to reach hatching, and it hatches into an aquatic larva. So these larvae have, um, they have external gills and a long tail fin that goes all the way up the back, and that's useful in the water as, as a paddle. So because when they're full, the uh, vernal pools are such an amazing concentration of resources, while they're in the larval state, the salamanders can double in size every two weeks. And after about three to five months, they've reached a large enough size that they can go through metamorphosis. So at that point, they resorb the external gills and the tail fin and turn into a metamorph, which immediately re-enters the burrow system. So a really important part of the life history is that the uh, Vernal pools have to hold water long enough for the larva to be able to reach a large enough size that they can go through metamorphosis and turn into the terrestrial form, which immediately goes back underground um, to escape the you know, really warm and dry conditions during the summer in California. So the metamorph looks almost exactly the same as the juvenile and adult, except that it doesn't have its established spot pattern yet. So you can see here uh, the salamander has just sort of a mottled set of lighter colored areas on it. Uh, by the time it has completed its first summer in the terrestrial environment, uh, when it comes up again the following fall, it will have its established spot pattern which it keeps throughout the remainder of its life. Uh, on average, the salamanders take three to four years as a juvenile in order to reach a large enough size that they can start investing in reproduction and return to the pond to breed. And the uh, oldest recorded salamanders uh, are 13 years old. So as long as they don't get predated by something, the terrestrial salamanders can live a very long time. And I just want to mention these two species because these are the two species that the California tiger salamander simply can't live without. So uh, if you look at the forelimbs of the salamander, you'll see that they're not modified in any way for digging. And so they are using burrows that are created either by Boda's pocket gopher or the uh, California ground squirrel. And if you don't have one of these two species present in the landscape, then the California tiger salamander population can't persist. All right, so now I want to talk about when California tiger salamanders are active. So uh, a lot of the data I'm going to be presenting is from the Jepson Prairie Preserve, which is shown here. And uh, the preserve has two large tiger salamander breeding ponds. The first is Olcott Lake, which is the largest uh, California tiger salamander breeding pond at this point. The second is Round Pond, which is uh, much smaller uh, than Olcott. It's a more typical size for a playa pool, but that's still much larger than the average California tiger salamander breeding pond, which now it's 
mostly man-made ponds that were originally designed to provide water for cattle. And so around the north, uh, northeast quadrants of both ponds, we have this set of drift fences. And so at each pond, you have a continuous shoreline drift fence and then discontinuous fence lines at 100, 200, 300, up to a kilometer from the pond edge. So what we do is we have the pitfall traps associated with these ponds open every rainy night from October to the end of March, and then every day during the uh, metamorph emergence period, so as the ponds are drying and the metamorph salamanders are coming out of them. And so using this data, we can figure out both when the tiger salamanders are active and what parts of the environment they're active in. All right, so the tiger salamanders are using three main types of habitat. So first, they're active on the terrestrial surface, um, only on well, in two distinct periods. So first there's the adult and juvenile movement period, which is in the winter, and they're only active during rain events. And second is the metamorph emergence period, which happens as the ponds are drying down in the spring and summer. The, other, the next type of habitat is the aquatic habitat. So um, the uh, different stages of the salamanders, the adults, the eggs, the larvae being present in the vernal pools themselves. And then there's a third hidden habitat, which is the underground burrow system. So I'm going to be focusing on the terrestrial surface and the aquatic habitat, but it's important to keep in mind that at any given point, the majority of the salamander population is underground in the burrow system. So I'm going to be talking about uh, ways you could avoid impacting salamanders as they're moving across the surface of the terrestrial environment or in the ponds. So you have to remember that at any time of year, if you're doing an activity that would impact the burrow system itself, the salamanders are always going to be there. So if you're doing any sort of digging, you always have to be aware of how that's going to impact the salamanders. All right, so this summarizes when adult and juvenile salamanders are active on the terrestrial surface. I'm going to be showing a lot of tables with this same general format. So um, you have the list of each year that we did the study at Jepson Prairie. And then the start and end dates are set such that if you started looking for salamanders on this list of dates and stopped looking on this list of dates, you'd find 95% of the movement. So there's a few salamanders starting either earlier or continuing after this, but this encompasses the vast majority of the movement that is occurring. And so I'm going to talk both about the averages of when um, the salamanders stop, start and stop moving in a given year, and also about what factors predict the variation in the start and end times of the movement. So you can see on average, the adult and juvenile salamanders are active for about four months on the terrestrial surface, starting at the very end of October and continuing until the end of February. For when they start moving, it turns out that the start date is positively correlated with the date at which annual precipitation reaches 0.56 inches. So for annual precipitation, I'm referring to the California uh, wet season, so starting at the beginning of September and going to the end of the next August, so not the calendar year. And so what this means is that if the rains arrive earlier, the salamanders will come up earlier, and if the rains arrive later, they'll come up later. But what it also says is that the salamanders don't come up to the very first rain event. So it needs to rain about half an inch or a little bit more in order for the salamanders to start responding. So it takes a certain amount of moisture just to get the ground saturated enough that the salamanders will start coming up out of their burrows. Then for the end dates, uh, these are positively correlated with November rainfall and negatively correlated with February rainfall. 
So what this means is that if it rains a lot in November, then salamander movement will continue later into the spring. And the reason for that is that the salamanders are trying to use the rainfall in November to predict how good a rain year this is going to be. So if it rains a lot in November, they project that this will be a good year to invest in breeding. So a lot of adults come up and a lot of breeding occurs. And since a larger total number of salamanders are active on the surface, that's going to push the end date later into the spring, just because more total salamanders are active in that year. If it looks like, if there's not much rain in November, they're going to project that it's going to be a bad year, and a lot of them will just skip breeding, because on average, each adult only breeds twice in its lifespan, so they need to pick good years to put that reproductive effort into. And then it's negatively correlated with February rainfall. That may seem a little non-intuitive, but uh, basically by February, almost all of them will have finished breeding and they'll want to get back into their burrow. So if it rains a lot in February, then there's a lot of good movement days and they can get back underground really quickly. So that pushes the date earlier. If it doesn't really rain in February, then good movement days are more spread out and thus salamander movement is also more spread out and they may not be able to get back to their burrow until really late February or even into March. All right, so this is the same situation for the metamorph emergence period. And you can see that on average, the salamanders start emerging in mid-May and they're usually done by very early July. So the start date is positively correlated with March rainfall. So if it rains a lot in March, the salamanders will wait longer until they start coming out of the pond. And the reason for that is that, well, you have to ask yourself, what is the impetus to get out of the breeding pond? And the impetus is that if the pond is really close to drying, you have to get out before all the aquatic habitat is just gone. So if it rains a lot in March, then the pond's going to hold water later into the season and there's not that same drive to get out early, so they can wait a little bit longer. And then for the end dates, uh, it's just positively correlated with pond drying dates. So if the pond is holding water longer into the spring, then the salamanders can wait longer in order to get out. If the pond's drying earlier, then they have to get out before it dries or they just die of desiccation as the pond dries up. And so conclusions for this is that uh, you want to avoid activities that will impede salamander movement on the terrestrial surface first after the uh, first half inch of rain in the fall up until mid-March, and then for the metamorphs from mid-May until whenever the breeding ponds in the vicinity dry up. And so types of activities that you want to think about here are um, things that would actually crush salamanders as they walked across the surface of the terrestrial landscape. So that would be things like operating uh, vehicles at night, since that's when the salamanders are moving, and also having structures set up that would actually be a barrier to the salamanders as they're making their migrations to and from the pond, if they're the breeding adults, or if they're coming out of the pond as the metamorphs. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the aquatic habitat. So here the start date is when you need to start looking in order to find 95% of the adults entering the pond to breed, and the end dates are when you need to stop looking in order to get 95% of the metamorphs coming out of the pond. And so start date is positively correlated with the first 0.82 inches after the end of October. So um, this is very similar to the adult uh, juvenile movement period in that if it rains earlier, the salamanders will come out earlier. If it starts raining later, they'll come out later. But what's different here is that it, the adults won't actually start entering the breeding ponds until after the end of October. So even if it pours in October and the ponds actually start to fill then, the adults still won't go into breeding. 
so they are more attuned to the average rain year where it, on average the ponds won't even start filling until into November. And so they're just not really responding to October rains. And then the end dates, um, again, it's pretty much entirely driven by the pond drying date. So if the pond dries early, they come out early. If the pond dries late, they'll stay in later. And now I just want to talk a little bit about hydro period because I've seen a lot of different numbers thrown around as to how long a pond would need to hold water in order to support uh, tiger salamander population. And there are, I've seen numbers saying as low as 60 days is enough. And I just want to point out that based on this set of numbers, uh, 60 days clearly isn't sufficient for the salamanders in, to, you know, first complete breeding, then have the eggs hatch, then have the larvae get to a large enough size that they can actually metamorphose. So at Jepson Prairie, the lowest average we saw was 88 days, and I think this is really close to the minimum because here the ponds uh, filled really late, so they didn't fill until mid-March, and then they still dried relatively early, which is the impetus for the salamanders to get out as fast as they possibly can. And even more than that, I just want to point out that only these three years did the salamander population at Jepson Prairie grow. So these are the really good years um, when the ponds held water long enough that enough larvae could reach metamorph metamorphosis that they're actually replacing the number of juveniles and adults that died that year just to natural mortality. And in these years, you need an even higher number of days of inundation so what you really want is ponds that hold water for four or six months in order for a really large cohort of metamorph salamanders to be able to get out of the ponds. So basically what it comes down to is you want to avoid activities in the aquatic habitat pretty much for the entire period that the aquatic habitat is present. Um, so the adults will get into the pond usually pretty, pretty close to when the ponds start to hold water, only if it happens to fill in October, they won't respond to that. But in most years, it won't even fill in October, and so they're coming in right as it starts to fill. And then they, there will be larvae into the ponds right up until when they dry up. And I should say that that's true for uh, natural vernal pools like the ones we were studying at Jepson Prairie. It may be different for um, artificial ponds, which are dug a little deeper and tend to hold water later into the summer. So uh, at Jepson, the ponds are always dry by mid-July. Other places, the ponds actually hold water up into September and October, so very close to the start of the next rain season. And in those cases, the salamanders may come out before they actually are forced to by the pond drying. Um, so if you want to uh, do something to manage to the aquatic habitat, uh, you're going to need to do it before the next wet season starts, and there may be a small window um, you know, between pond drying of the previous year and the fill of the next. And if you can fit your activity into that window, that's great. If you need a little bit more time, then the salamanders may actually come out earlier if it's a pond that really holds water that late. And then for what, it, what makes an adequate hydro period, um, ponds need to hold water at least until mid-May for the salamanders to be able to get out of the ponds. And on average, you want ponds that hold waters at least until early June. Um, if a pond holds water that long in an average year, then there should be some years in which you get really good uh, recruitment of metamorphs. So that's the factors that determine salamander movement on sort of a seasonal scale. But within uh, those seasonal periods, there's even a finer regulation by weather patterns. And so what this list is for each year 
uh, how many days you would need uh, to look at to encompass 95% of the salamanders moving around during that year. And so the total adult juvenile movement period is on average 140 days, but only 15 of those days are ones where 95% uh, of the movement is occurring. So even within that period of the year when the salamanders are moving around, they're only actually moving on the surface on a very small number of those days. So if you could identify those days, then you could just avoid activities on those few days, and that's most of you know, whatever development activities uh, you are trying to regulate you know, could take up the rest of the time and thus not be impeded much by concerns for the salamander. So in order to try to predict what those days are, uh, I took our number of salamanders captured each day and correlated with, with a bunch of different weather variables. So I can say that in general, you get more salamanders on days where there is more precipitation, where the minimum temperature is higher, where there's higher wind speed, and where there's higher humidity. So this all makes sense because the salamanders are choosing days uh, <coughs> basically where there's a storm event. And all of these are typical of storms, so obviously precipitation. Also, during a storm event, the additional cloud cover will keep minimum temperatures higher, there will tend to be higher wind speed, and there will tend to be more humidity in the air. So that gives you a general correlation that you'll tend to get more salamanders on days with those types of features. What I haven't been able to find is a hard and fast rule saying something like, minimum temperature needs to be at this, at least this high for salamanders to move, wind speed needs to be at least this high, or humidity needs to be at at least this level. So what I can say, the one hard, fast rule seems to be that it has to, there has to be at least some amount of precipitation. So uh, on average, there's 32 rain nights per year in California, at least in the Jepson Prairie area, and so those are the nights that you need to look for salamander movement. So for the metamorphs, they have to get out of the pond before it dries, so they can't be as picky about the uh, weather that is occurring during that period. So they would prefer the same type of day as the adults and juveniles, so they would prefer to move during a storm event, but they have to get out of the pond before it dries, and since this is usually occurring in late May or June, at that point in California there may not be any storm events. So you may get large numbers of metamorphs coming out even on days where there's no precipitation whatsoever. And so this just shows that uh, there's a huge variation between years. So in some years you get large numbers of metamorphs emerging, and in some years you even get zero. So 91% uh, of the total metamorph emergence we uh, detected was in just four of the nine years of our study. So overall, if you're going to try to avoid uh, doing activities on nights when the salamanders are active, um, you want to avoid the 32 nights per year where there's uh, predicted to be rainfall, although within that it's, they're only going to be using about half of those days, but you just can't tell which of those days they're going to be beforehand, at least up to this point we haven't found a way to tell those. And then during the metamorph emergence period, on average, there's another 30 days from mid-May until when the ponds dry, and you're going to want to avoid that as well, although, again, the salamanders will actually only be utilizing about half of those days. So overall, we've focused in on about 60 nights per year where we can say there's a good probability of the salamanders moving around on the terrestrial surface, although they will actually only be utilizing about half of those days. Still, it gives you an idea of the most important periods to think about uh, how salamanders would be moving around in the terrestrial environment and how you'd want to avoid impacting them. All right, so that's uh, really good if you want to think about um, movement on the terrestrial surface, but if you want to think about the salamanders down in the burrow system, 
what's really important is just to know which parts of the landscape they would even be occurring in. So now I'm going to be talking about where in the uh, terrestrial environment the salamanders are actually located. So uh, this is again using the data from Jepson Prairie. And if you look at the drift fence array, you can see that it was originally designed in order to test for migration distances. So basically at each distance from the pond edge, you have uh, replicated drift fences. And so you can use the number of captures at each drift fence to find an average salamander density at each distance. And then since you have that estimate replicated over different distances from the pond edge, you can take that set of densities and fit a curve to it in order to predict how far out from the pond different percentages of the salamander population are. So I'm going to uh, show some graphs illustrating how you would do that. So this is data just from Olcott Lake, just from 2005-2006. And it's breaking the densities between the three uh, age classes of salamanders that we can visually identify. And what I just want to show here is that the different age classes have very different density distributions. So uh, metamorph salamanders are really concentrated right at the pond edge. Juveniles are actually at their highest density slightly farther out from the pond edge. And then adults have their highest density, uh, again, right at the pond edge. Um, but it tails off much more gradually than with the metamorphs. And so what we wanted to do was figure out a way to con combine these three different density curves into a single curve that represents how important habitat is to the salamander population. So we decided to do that based on reproductive value. So this says each salamander should be valued based on how likely it is to provide offspring to continuing the population. So for adults, 100% of adults are contributing offspring to the population. But for juveniles, they have to first survive to reach adulthood before they can also contribute offspring. So as it turns out, 38% of juveniles are going to make it to adulthood. And for metamorphs, it's 14%. So if people saw my talk in September, you'll notice that these values are slightly different. So um, since September, I've finished analyzing the recapture data from Jepson Prairie. Um, so previously, we've been using demo a demographic model generated from the Hastings Natural History Reservation in the Carmel Valley. Now that I've finished analyzing the recapture data from Jepson, I've been able to use that to parameterize a Jepson-specific demographic model. So now we have the density data and the demographic model from the same population, which is really much better. And so uh, what it looks like is that a Jepson, the average age of adults is slightly lower, so it's 3.3 years, as opposed to 4.1 years at Hastings. So they're maturing a bit faster. And that's why uh, the metamorphs are more likely to reach adulthood, because they don't need to make it through quite as many years in order to be able to reproduce. So this 0.14 is up from 0.08 previously. And then for juveniles, it turns out that the lower age to maturity is offset almost exactly by higher mortality rates. So uh, those almost cancel each other out. So this 0.38 is only changed from 0.37. And so if you take the three uh, density curves I showed you earlier and combine them with this function, it turns out that it fits remarkably well to a dense, uh, an exponential decay function. And that matches pretty well with our expectation. So if you have uh, random migration from a point source, you should get an exponential decay. And in our case, we do have a point source, which is the breeding pond. Uh, dispersal isn't actually random because the salamanders make directed movements. But it turns out it still fits really well to that null expectation. 
And so with the new job demographic model, it even fits slightly better uh, than, when, than with the previous one. Here, this is still only data from Olcott Lake from 2005-2006. And we actually have data from two different breeding ponds, Olcott Lake and Round Pond, and we have it for eight different years. So we want to somehow account for the variation both in space between the two ponds and in time between the eight different years. So these are the results of a repeated measures ANOVA. And you can see that uh, all of the main factors have a significant impact on density. So density changes with distance from the breeding pond. It changes between which of the two ponds you're looking at and it changes depending on which year you're observing the population. Uh, more importantly for this exercise, it also changes uh, the relationship of distance with density changes based on what year you're observing it and within year depending on which pond you're looking at. So since there's all this spatial and temporal variation, what we want to do is just average across it so that we get the most accurate picture at the average pond in the average year. And so that is this function. So this function shows as you move away from the pond what is the density of reproductive value of salamanders at any given distance. And this function is really useful because if you integrate underneath it, you can calculate how far out from the edge of the pond you would need to go in order to get a set percentage of the salamander population. So this is the result of integrating that previous function. Uh, after also accounting for the fact that you, that this isn't happening in a single dimension, so if you go out from the breeding pond in any direction, north, south, east, west, you'll get the same uh, decay in density so it's not happening just as you go out in one direction, but in all directions. If you account for that and integrate, this is the result. And so once you have this curve, you can just say what percentage of the salamander population you're interested in. Here I said 50%. Draw across and then look down and say, all right, in order to get 50% of the salamanders, we have to go out 504 meters. So now I just want to put that in context of other salamander species that are closely related to the California tiger salamander. So as it turns out, California tiger salamanders are migrating almost twice as far as any other species in their genus that has been studied, at least. And um, that's a bit surprising, but when you think about these other species, it sort of makes sense. So, it turns out that all other studies of embistomatid salamanders that look at migration distance have occurred on the east coast of the U.S. in species that inhabit woodland. So it's just really different from the dry grasslands that the California tiger salamander is occupying. And so what we think may be happening is that density of resources is much lower in a dry grassland, so the salamanders have to be more spread out in order to be able to support themselves. Alternatively, it could just be easier to migrate through grassland because there's fewer obstacles. But in any case, this does show that tiger salamanders are taking up a lot of space in the terrestrial habitat. They're not just right around the pond edge. So the integration method, which I just showed, is really great in some ways. Um, What's really nice about it is that it is amalgamating data from the largest number of ponds, largest number of years, and largest number of individual salamanders. So over 30,000 salamander captures went into that one estimate. The problem with it is that we are using it to uh, project beyond the edge of where the data was actually collected. So the farthest drift fences at Jepson Prairie are one kilometer from the edge of the breeding ponds. But once we fit that exponential decay function to it, we want to predict how far salamanders will go, even if it's beyond one kilometer. So then the question is, are those 
projections reasonable, or are we starting to project distances that a salamander simply couldn't travel? So in order to check that, we used a second method, which is to look at individual recapture events based on pattern recognition. So for each salamander we capture, we take a picture of its dorsal spot pattern and then feed it into a pattern recognition algorithm. So the pattern recognition uh, fits a mold to the uh, dorsal surface of the salamander and then unfolds that to show what it would look as a 2D image. And then for every new photograph that you enter into the system, it compares that 2D image to every previous entry and tells you whether or not it is a recapture event. So using that individual recapture data, we can say that the average rate of movement for a migrating adult is 150 meters per night, and that most adults are active for two to five nights during both immigration, so coming into the pond, and for emigration, so leaving the pond after breeding. So if we say on average, an adult travels 150 meters per night for three and a half nights, then the average adult should travel 525 meters. And that is really remarkably similar to our 504 meter estimate using the integration method. So up to this point, the two methods seem to be agreeing well. So now we want to project to even further distances. So what if we wanted to capture 95% of the salamanders? Using the integration method, we'd say, all right, to get 95%, of the salamander population, we're having to go out to 1,703 meters. So now the question is, could a California tiger salamander actually migrate that far within a single year? Well, from the individual recapture data, we know that 188 meters per night is a sustainable rate of movement. So we captured an individual salamander averaging that rate over six nights in a row. So if it doesn't get tired, going at that rate for six nights, that's probably a rate it can keep up continuously. In each year, there are 10 to 19 nights with appropriate weather conditions that salamanders could actually move on them during both immigration and, again, during emigration. So even on a dry year, which only had 10 good nights, at 188 meters per night, a salamander should be able to go up to 1,880 meters. So our estimate of uh, 1,703 meters from the integration method is definitely within the ecophysiological capability of a California tiger salamander, given both what they are able to do in terms of rate of movement and both in terms of the weather conditions providing good nights to actually move on. And now that I've finished processing our recapture data, we actually have evidence that, sound, that individual marked salamanders are moving this far. So here we have uh, data from a salamander that was marked as a metamorph emerging from Round Pond and then recaptured three years later as a breeding adult male uh, leaving Olcott Lake after breeding. So that shows an actual individual marked salamander that traveled almost 2,000 meters uh, between its two different capture events. So that's now very strong, really hard, fast evidence showing that our estimate of 1,703 meters from the integration method is definitely something a salamander is capable of doing. And so our conclusion is that the two methods, the integration method and the individual recapture method, agree very well. And so we can say that the average adult probably does travel close to 500 meters from the pond, which is almost twice the distance of any of its congeners. And there is no reason to doubt that the top 5% of migrants are going up to 1,703 meters. And so the current buffer for California tiger salamander habitat used by Fish and, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, which says that any habitat within 1.3 miles, which is equal to 2,092 meters, of a breeding pond is tiger salamander habitat, uh, is pretty close to our uh, estimate of 1,703 meters. Um, it falls within the confidence interval of that estimate. So um, 
we think that's a pretty good buffer to continue using. So all of that data was from just a single landscape, the landscape at Jetson Prairie. And the question is, is that representative of other landscapes that California tiger salamanders inhabit? And so our one other uh, data set where we can actually look at that is from the Hastings Natural History Reservation in the Carmel Valley. So here is data based on the number of salamanders that switched between breeding ponds in different years. So in one year they bred in one pond, and then as a, in a subsequent year they bred in another pond. So in this data set, you got salamanders uh, changing between breeding ponds up to 670 meters apart, and such a large fraction of them uh, made that switch that if you fit the exponential decay function to that data, uh, you get this curve, and if you integrate underneath that, you would say that 95% of the population would go up to uh, 1,678 meters, which is really close to our estimate from Jepson Prairie. So it seems like even though the landscape at Hastings, which is up in the coast range, is very different from Jepson Prairie, which is out in the Central Valley, the salamanders seem to be behaving pretty similarly in the two different locations. So now that we have this estimate of migration distance, I just want to give a couple ideas about how this could be put to use in terms of conservation. So currently, when you are doing mitigation, uh, most mitigation is done on a simple per area basis. So if you develop one acre of habitat in one location, you need to conserve one acre of habitat somewhere else. What that doesn't account for is that habitat can be of varying quality. So what we're proposing here is to value land based on how important it is to the salamanders. So the shape of this function is the same as the shape of that density of reproductive value that I showed you earlier. So it's valuing habitat the same way that that habitat is valuable to the salamander population. And the height of the curve is adjusted such that if you were to mitigate for all of the land, all of the salamander habitat around a single breeding pond using this curve, you would, say, you would pay the same total mitigation cost as using the flat one-to-one -one, uh, function based just on area. So what this function does is it uh, provides incentive to avoid the habitat that is most important to the salamanders. So if you're looking to develop habitat right at the edge of the shoreline, you have to pay 10.8 times as much. And so that provides a financial incentive to just not locate your project in that area. If you have the choice to move it further from the salamander breeding pond, then you will do so. And thus you'll have the least possible impact on the salamanders. This also uh, suggests that California tiger salamanders could serve as an umbrella species for other uh, listed species that occupy California vernal pool grasslands. So because California tiger salamanders have such large habitat requirements because they're traveling so far from their breeding ponds, if you protect the California tiger salamanders, you're not just protecting single breeding ponds with a small buffer around them, you're actually protecting continuous vernal pool landscapes because the interpond distance is usually shorter than the 1.3 miles that you're putting around each tiger salamander breeding pond. So uh, you're actually protecting different individual ponds and also all of the connecting landscape between them such that you can have movement between the ponds. And so that will help not only the salamanders, but as it turns out, there's 89 other listed species that also occur within that buffer around a California tiger salamander breeding pond, and thus you're providing an umbrella that will support all of them as well. And just to give an idea of what a few of those species are, um, this is Solano grass, which is a uh, vernal pool specialist. Uh, this is the Conservancy fairy shrimp and the vernal pool tadpole shrimp. Um, 
again, Whirlpool specialists found a few places such as uh, Olcott Lake at Jepson. Then things like uh, Steelhead, the Santa Cruz long-toed salamander, uh, the cuckoo, the blunt-nosed leopard lizard, and the kit fox. So all other species that are sharing habitat with California tiger salamanders and will be protected by putting this buffer around tiger salamander breeding ponds. All right, last I want to talk about a mesocosm experiment uh, we finished last spring looking at the community level impacts of hybridization with uh, the bar tiger salamander, which is an invasive species introduced from Texas. So <clears throat> the reason the bar tiger salamanders were introduced into California is that they uh, create these, uh, what they're called pedomorphs, which are basically uh, mature salamanders that have retained all of their larval characteristics. So here you can see the average uh, tiger salamander larva, and this is a pedomorph. So by becoming mature in the larval form, they can get much bigger, even much bigger than a terrestrial adult. And as a result, they can lay far more eggs. And because there's so much more resources in the aquatic habitat, they can do that faster. So if there's any sort of permanent water source that would support a pedomorph, it's just a much more successful life history strategy because you are maturing faster and you're producing more offspring. So now that California has, um, now that we're impounding water to either for agriculture or for cattle, there are more of these permanent water sources and thus this life history strategy, which didn't used to be successful in the California landscape, now really is in certain habitats. So <clears throat> basically the question is, uh, you know, since these barred tiger salamanders get so much larger and are now starting to replace the native California tiger salamanders, what is that impact on the rest of the vernal pool community? So are they really filling mostly the same ecological role or um, is the invasive doing something entirely different and something that we wouldn't want to see happening to the rest of the vernal pond community. So this <coughs> shows uh, how the hybrids have spread. So basically all of the uh, red dots are the original introduction sites. So around 1950, uh, someone from the Salinas Valley drove out to Texas in a pickup truck, filled the bed of their truck with water, filled the water with larval bar tiger salamanders, drove back to California, and then distributed the larval salamanders to a number of different uh, ponds. And the reason for doing this is that uh, this really big pedomorph is better as a uh, bait for fishing. So if you want to catch bass, you're going to do much better with this large pedomorph salamander than with one of these tiny larvae. And so they were really just doing a favor to all of the California fishermen by providing this higher quality bait. It's important to keep in mind that at that point there wasn't anything illegal about uh, transporting salamanders in this way. But because in the new agricultural landscape, which has more permanent water, the Texas life history is turning out to be more successful, after being introduced, the hybrids have begun to spread. So they first started interbreeding with California tiger salamanders, and then the resulting hybrids turned out to be more fit, and thus they're starting to gradually spread across the landscape. So at this point, uh, any land within about 10 kilometers of the, in of the original introduction sites is mostly hybrid. Um, so on average, the genes introduced by uh, 
the bar tiger salamander are spreading at a rate of about uh, one kilometer per tiger salamander generation. But it turns out that there's a few genes that are moving even faster. So um, at this point, we have 68 uh, genetic markers that are spread pretty evenly across the tiger salamander genome. And three of these 68 markers are moving much faster than all the others. And we've turned these three markers the superinvasive markers. So I'm also going to be calling salamanders that are otherwise pure California tiger salamanders but have these three genetic markers from the barred tiger salamander. I'm going to be calling those superinvasives. And then so those genes are spreading at a much faster rate, about one kilometer per year, such that they are now up to, uh, it's almost 100 kilometers from the in, uh, original introductions. And beyond that, you still have mostly pure California tiger salamanders, which don't have any genes from the uh, Texas salamanders. And so uh, what that amounts to over here is that uh, this line here is the same distance as this red line here. Oh, no. Uh, this box around the mostly hybrids is the same as this distance here. And so most of the invasive genes drop off before you reach that line, but the three super invasive markers go much farther, such that you find you know, very high frequencies of them all the way up to this distance, which is more up here. All right, so questions are, how should the hybrids be managed? So are they basically just filling the same ecological role that pure California tiger salamanders would have filled before? And then <clears throat> does the answer to this question change whether, based on whether we're looking at full hybrids, which have all 68 of those, or a large, fraction of those 68 markers from the Texas salamander as opposed to ones that only have three of those markers from the Texas salamander. And so the way we decided to look at, look at this is in terms of ecological equivalency. So if they're having the same impact on the rest of the community members in the vernal pools, then they're a pretty good substitute for pure California tiger salamanders. If they're not having the same role in the community, then we need to be worried about them. So we <coughs> address this using a mesocosm experiment. And so, uh, <coughs> our, so it's a four by two factorial. So the, there's four treatments for larval genotype. And those treatments are some mesocosms. So each mesocosm is one of these uh, cattle tanks, which is a 300-gallon tank when full. And so some tanks get pure California tiger salamander larvae, some get the super invasives, some get the full hybrids, and then there's a no tiger salamander treatment, which represents what would happen to a community if tiger salamanders were removed from the landscape entirely. And then that's crossed against two levels of larval density, so uh, tanks where there's four larvae, per mesocosm, and then ones where there's eight. And so uh, four by two is eight treatment combinations. There's five replicates of each, so 40 tanks total. And so uh, we collected the full hybrids from this site, which is right in the center of the original introduction. So all of those larvae should be fixed for um, the high frequency of Texas genes. The superinvasives came from Fort Ord, which should be fixed for only the superinvasive genes. And then the pure California tiger salamanders came from Jepson Prairie, which is beyond the spread of the hybrids up to this point. And then for each pond, we took nine uh, community metrics. So we measured the densities of nine different members of the community. Uh, these range from uh, chlorophyll, so that sort of represents the resource base of the community, a couple of measures of zooplankton, cladocera and copepods, and then 
a bunch of uh, macro, uh, mostly invertebrates, uh, one other vertebrate, which is the uh, chorus frog tadpole, and then also uh, paraphyton, which is the algae that's not floating around but is uh, rather attached to the edges of the pond. And so uh, this and the next slide are just sort of describing the experimental setup. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. What's important here is that we tried as much as possible to uh, replicate an actual vernal pond community, both in terms of the community members. So we went out and sampled uh, 15 natural California tiger salamander breeding ponds to look at what are the natural densities of all of these species. And then we also tried to match the phenology of those ponds, so adding species at the same time that they would appear in a natural pond. <coughs> then at the end, uh, we measured the, so we, you know, we add the larvae at the end of March, and then towards the end of May, uh, so two months later, we uh, measure chlorophyll, cladostera, copepod, and paraphyton. And then right as the ponds are finishing drying, we measure the densities of all the other uh, macro species. And we also collect the metamorphosing sudacres and tiger salamanders as they're finishing metamorphosis throughout this entire period. And so using that data, uh, we can project the location of each mesocosm into a multivariate community space. And what this shows is that, um, so California tiger salamanders, you have 10 individual tanks that had the pure California tiger salamanders, which are represented by the uh, blue diamonds. But if you look at the average of all of them, that would be this point here, which is the centroid for the individual uh, mesocosms. And it's surrounded by a circle that re represents the 95% confidence interval for that centroid. And so the takeaway here is that the 95% confidence intervals for pure California tiger salamanders and pure superinvasives overlap. So they are not statistically distinguishable from each other. It seems that the Superinvasive salamanders that only have three markers from the invasive cal from the invasive Texas species are filling basically the same community role as the pure California natives. Then you have the centroid for the hybrids and its 95% confidence interval. So it's statistically distinguishable from the pure California tiger salamander but it's not nearly as far as having no tiger salamander larvae whatsoever. So it's filling some of the role of a pure native California tiger salamander, but it's not exactly the same as the superinvasives are. So now I'm going to look at the individual uh, community axes, so the nine individual variables we measured to show where these differences are coming from. So this is a summary of the food web that we think is occurring in the ponds. So California tiger salamanders directly prey on clam shrimp, snails, and uh, chorus frog tadpoles. And then uh, those prey on the paraphyte and algae and on the cladostera and zooplankton. So first I'm going to look at the uh, first trophic level, so tiger salamanders feeding on their direct prey. And so this shows that uh, when you have no tiger salamander larvae present, which is this column, you get much higher densities of all of those prey species. And that makes sense because you've freed them from their direct predator. So that's why all of the all different treatments that have some sort of tiger salamander present are more similar to each other than the treatment where there's no tiger salamander larvae at all. Then you look at the next uh, trophic level, which is the prey of the salamander prey, 
And again, it's the same sort of thing uh, where the prey of the salamanders are at high densities, um, which is here where, the, where there's no tiger salamander larvae to prey on them, um, they depress the trophic level that is another rung beneath them. Where there are tiger salamander larvae present, they control the mid-level of the food web, and thus the resource base below that is at a higher density. So again, this is showing why all three uh, treatments that have some sort of tiger salamander present are more similar than the treatment without any tiger salamanders. Then these two are showing uh, why the full hybrids are different from the um, pure CTS treatment. So uh, CHL represents chlorophyll. So you get much higher levels of chlorophyll in a full hybrid pond than in a pure CTS pond. And we're not really sure why that's true, but it seems like it would be a very important uh, community level effect because having more chlorophyll also makes the water overall more turbid and that's changing the entire structure of the pond. The other uh, individual axis that they differ on is uh, this one, which is for nodonectids. So you get a much lower density of nodonectids, which is the back swimmer, when, hybrids are, when full hybrids are present than in pure CTS ponds. And what we think this is is that uh, pure nodonectids are uh, a less preferred prey of tiger salamanders. And so um, the hybrids end up eating them because they've already depressed all the other prey to a low level, and thus they need to switch to this uh, less preferred prey, whereas California tiger salamanders aren't depressing the prey so much that they don't need to resort to feeding on back swimmers. So even though um, there was no statistical difference on on all of these axes, you can see that in each case, the full hybrid uh, reduces its prey to a lower density than either the pure CTS or the super invasive. So because they're reaching that larger size, they're eating an overall larger number of their prey. Um, so then this looks at sort of the morphological distance differences between the uh, metamorphs that are coming out of these mesocosms. And uh, what I just want to show here is that the full hybrids are growing to a much larger size in terms of both snout vent length and mass, especially in the uh, low density environment. So what it seems like is that the uh, full hybrids are just much more flexible in terms of their life history. And if there's any sort of thing they can take advantage of, they will. So in this case, if there's a lower density of competitors, they'll grow to a much larger size than either the super invasives or the pure CTS. Um, I guess we can skip all of that. And then the other thing I want to point out is that they will also take advantage of a longer hydro period. So in terms of how average mass at metamorphosis changes through time, you can see that the biggest, uh, lar the biggest metamorphs of both pure CTS and super invasives are emerging at the beginning of the breathing of the beginning of the emergence period and then gradually declining in size down to here, whereas the full hybrids either remain constant or actually increase in size over the, over the course of the emergence period. So if ponds do tend to get large, longer hydro periods in agricultural environments or even become perennial, uh, better and better uh, bar tiger salamanders will emerge later and later, whereas the uh, pure CTS and the super invasives are sort of fixed to try to get out earlier if they're capable of doing so. So what are the conclusions of this? So sort of 
you know, from the very outset, our minds, are, you know, if we can have ponds that have pure CTS, that's the goal because that's how the landscape was before the uh, invasive species from Texas was introduced. So that's sort of the gold standard. Um, super invasives are the most ecologically similar to pure CTS and both their community effects and life history strategy uh, are not statistically distinguishable from pure CTS. So they seem to be a pretty good substitute. If we can't have pure CTS, super invasives are basically doing the same thing in the vernal pool community. Um, having no tiger salamanders is less desirable than having hybrids. So hybrids are filling some of the role of pure CTS. They're not exactly the same. We've seen those two axes in which they're statistically different and even on the axes where they're not uh, statistically distinguishable, they're still tending to eat more and thus depress the densities of all other species in the pond to a greater extent than a native would. And so if we can, we should manage habitats to decrease the percentage of, invas of invasive genes by decreasing hydroperiods. And how that will work is if instead of letting the pond hold water up to here, you cut it off here, well, now you're still getting the most fit natives, but you're killing off the most fit hybrids. So by decreasing hydroperiods, you should be able to push natural selection such that it's starting to favor the natives relative to the uh, introduced hybrids, although it may not be able to push it all the way back to pure natives, but at least you're trying to move the percentage so that you'll get a higher percentage of native genes, even if it's not going to actually be fixed for native genes. And then uh, just some future questions. Uh, so if pure CTS and super invasives are ecologically equivalent, then why are the super invasive genes racing across the landscape? So clearly there's some part of this picture that we're still not getting, because if they were really exactly the same, then those genes wouldn't be spreading so quickly because natural selection wouldn't be forcing them across the landscape. Um, so also we know that there's these particular markers that are spreading, but we don't know the actual genes they're coding for. So if we can figure out what these genes actually do, that should help us understand why this is occurring. And finally, in this case, we were testing <laughs> You know, pure CTS, which has 0% invasive genes, super invasives, which have 4% uh, invasive genes, and full hybrids, which have 71% invasive genes. But what would happen is something in between, like a 50% or 25%. So, you know, would that be better than 71% or is that basically the same? Because changing between 50 and 25% might actually be possible by adjusting the hydro periods, changing from 50% down to 4% may not really be achievable at this point. So would the difference between 50 and 25 actually be meaningful in terms of the community? And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of my co-authors on uh, the various studies that went into this, and also all of our different funding sources, because keeping the a uh, long-term project going on at Jefferson Prairie for such a number of years required input from a lot of different financial sources, and we really appreciate that. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Adam Cross, who is one of my uh, main field assistants and who provided most of the photos in this, uh, Lex Hibby, who developed the pattern recognition program, and also, uh, in addition to my main field assistants, I also had lots of uh, volunteers who are either undergraduates at UC Davis or uh, from various consulting firms, and that really made uh, collecting all of that data on uh, over 30,000 capture events possible. That's it. Okay, so um, we're going to do some questions now. If you have a question, I'll bring you the microphone, and this is so that the people that are listening on WebEx can hear your question as well. And um, we actually have a couple questions on WebEx, so I'll read this to you first. Okay. Okay, so um, 
let's see, the first one, the migration ratio varying as a function of distance from pond is interesting. But in my experience as a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regulator in a past job, uh, getting into questions of habitat value is a double-edged sword in such situations. For example, if we start valuing CTS habitat by quality, we ignore other species using the habitat. Also, project proponents will be quick to seize on this and contend that their habitat is low quality, so they will actually pursue um, to get lower mitigation. Um, well, so I guess in terms of, so first looking from just the single species perspective, I would say that um, since we know enough about California tiger salamanders to say that distance from breeding pond is this important to um, how valuable the habitat is to them, then assigning mitigation values in terms of that particular metric, which is distance from pond, is just more accurate. So uh, if a you know, project proponent is developing habitat that is further from the breeding pond, that is having a lower impact on the California tiger salamanders, and they should be assessed at a lower rate for mitigation. Um, in fact, the whole idea of implementing this would be to provide incentive for people to do that. So if it's possible for them to move their project to a site that is further from tiger salamander breeding ponds, we want to provide the financial incentive to do that such that they would have to pay lower mitigation costs. Um, I think having a lower initial impact on the existing populations is even better than, you know, charging a high mitigation value such that they need to invest in more mitigation somewhere else. If you can incentivize them to have a lower impact from the get-go, then that's really the best possible outcome. Uh, in terms of having it for other species, it's true this only relates to California tiger salamanders. If sufficient uh, data has been collected on another species, then you could protect, uh, you know, you could pick another metric that's important to that species and value habitat in a way that would reflect what the other species needs. Um, at this, you know, I only have the data on the California tiger salamanders to show how that would work, but um, it's certainly possible to collect the data that you would be able to implement this for really any other listed species if you had sufficient data. Okay, and uh, your other question is um, referring back to your Jepson study. Why didn't the year 2012-2013 produce good numbers of CTS since it had a 148-day hydro period? Is it correlated with the timing uh, within the year? Uh, won't go all the way back to that. Uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> basically, 2012-2013 uh, had a really early rain season. So the ponds filled really early. Almost all of the breeding was done by mid-December. Uh, so that started out the breeding period early. But most of that since it's happening early, it's also happening when the water in the ponds is cold. So because of the cold water in the ponds, the developmental rate of the first embryos in the eggs and then the hatched larvae is much lower, and so they're not growing at the same rate as they would later in the season, like in April and May. So it had a long hydro period, but... Uh, it was early, and the, then the ponds, then it stopped raining, and the ponds ended up drying still in mid-May. And so, even though they got an early start, because they were developing at a slow rate, the salamanders were still really pressed by that early drying date in order to get out in time, and a lot of them just didn't make it. So, having a long period is important, but it's even more important for it to last long enough into the spring. So, um, at least until mid-May, or more preferably into at least early June, if you want to get a really good cohort of uh, salamanders coming out. Any more questions? Uh, 
So I have a question about um, the Bard Tiger Salamanders and the California Tiger Salamanders and how, or if you know anything about sexual selection and, or, like, are hybrids seen as more desirable for certain, for, like, natives or are natives choosing natives over hybrids? Do you know anything about sexual selection in that way? So there has been no study of sexual selection in the wild. Um, mostly because it would be really hard to do. Uh, you know, at least the jets in the water are so turbid that you can't observe anything that they're doing in the pond. Um, there's other sites with clearer water where you might be able to do it. Um, in the lab, it is really easy to get a female native California tiger salamander to breed with a male invasive Texas tiger salamander, and it's really hard to do the reverse. And that seems to be that male California tiger salamanders are much harder to get into breeding condition. Um, so for a long time, we couldn't get them to breed at all. Like you put them in a tank with the females and just nothing would happen. Uh, we eventually found that if you mimic the temperature profile that you find in the wild in your breeding facility, then that gets them in the right condition. So before we'd been keeping it at a you know, constant 60 degrees or something, which seemed nice for amphibians, not too hot. Um, but then what we did is we put probes into the burrow system at Jepson Prairie and measured how the temperature down in the burrows changes over the course of a year. And so it turns out that even though it's buffered to some extent from the surface temperature, so it doesn't get as hot in the summer and it doesn't get as cold in the winter, there still is you know, quite a substantial change over the course of a full year. And so if you mimic that in your breeding facility, that stimulates the, the male California tiger salamanders to breed. So they need to see it ramp up in the summer and then drop off in the fall to cue them into now is breeding time. So that means they may be more uh, sensitive to environmental conditions, but that's really only in the artificial habitat in your breeding facility. If you go out to the wild population, all of the adult males you see moving around in the winter are really ready to breed. So I don't know that that actually relates to anything that's happening in the wild. It may be that in the wild they're just as willing to mate as a Texas species. And so I don't think there's really any reason to think that sexual selection is playing a role, but again, no one has actually looked for it. Thanks. Hi. Um, so all this is, it's really helpful. It's great to have information and because we don't seem to have enough of it to make good decisions. And um, one thing is that I think that a lot of these conclusions are based on a lot more complicated um, input than what we're seeing here. You know, there's lots and lots of factors that go into the way things are. And so the only thing, uh, a concern that I have is when we have a presentation and we go away as regulators, you know, sometimes we're making decisions without, we have to consider all the factors you know, why things are the way they are. And, um, and I know that you did your studies at Jepson. I'm working a lot in stock pondy environments, you know, and I think there's a, just maybe a lot of different factors that we have to consider, and I wish we had more time to discuss everything. So I just want people to keep that in mind when they okay. look at the results of the data and conclusions and, like, the mitigation ratio uh, recommendation. I think it's just really complicated. There are so many things to consider when you're deciding uh, you know, when you're doing a value assessment on an impact site and on a conservation site, and they're not always exactly the same. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, so this is, so for that particular instance for the mitigation ratio, I'm still only doing it in terms of one metric of habitat quality. Uh, in our data, that was the most important metric, but it's definitely not the only one. For instance, 
there need to be at least some density of rodent burrows present or there won't be any tiger salamanders at all. Um, and within the Jepson Prairie landscape, there isn't a higher density of salamanders in areas that have more burrows. But obviously, if there were zero burrows, there would be zero salamanders. So at some level, it is really important. And so factors like that, which I didn't incorporate, should also be taken into account in some way. Um, in terms of things, other differences between stock ponds and the ponds at Jepson Prairie, um, in terms of the migration distance, at least, we have the data sets from Hastings, which is basically all stock ponds. And there, the migration distance looks to be almost identical to the one at Jepson. Um, but for other things like uh, the stuff with hydro period, stock ponds tend to hold water later. And so when I see all of my salamanders, or salamanders at Jepson waiting really up until the pond dries if they can, that may be quite different in a stock pond which has an overall higher hydro period. And uh, I just don't know how big an effect that would have. It could be pretty dissimilar or pretty similar, and, and we just don't have enough data yet. Can I, can I ask one more thing? Sure. OK. So, um, so we're having, we're kind of going through this dilemma in the perennial or near perennial ponds on predator loading and um, how that's affecting the results that we get, the successful metamorphosis out of the ponds. And I wondered if you had any information on that. Uh, well, so right, the big problem with perennial ponds is that they can support all sorts of invasive predators, uh, bullfrogs, crayfish, um, various introduced fishes. And if they get into the ponds, they'll basically decimate all of the larvae. So removing those is definitely important. And um, you know, I wouldn't tell anyone to avoid, to completely avoid impacting the aquatic habitat if they were going to go in and manage for things like that. It's okay to go in and try to control invasive predators, uh, even that if that means going into a pond that may still have a few uh, salamander larvae in it, because you're you need to, you know, weigh the two, the benefits and the costs of that, and it, and at some point it may just you know, be more beneficial to go in and manage than to wait so that you uh, completely minimize your impact on the, on the natives. I also have a question. Um, so under the California Endangered Species Act, there's, there's, it's really the take of the individual, whereas the federal is more about habitat. So um, when you did your distance study, is there anything else that would indicate um, the, the sort of max distance that CTS uh, may migrate to? Because uh, minimizing take is one thing, but completely avoiding is another. And so I thought I've read um, other literature that said that they, they actually go out much farther than that 1.27 mile. And I was wondering if you have any information. Uh, well, the highest estimate I've heard was uh, the 1.3 miles, which is how uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Service set that buffer as the extent of salamander habitat from the edge of a breeding pond. Um, you know, I, the max I can actually prove is that one individual we showed moving almost uh, 2,000 meters are uh, estimates from the individual recaptures show that in a wet year, a salamander should be capable of moving much farther. Um, but that just because they are capable of doing it and the environmental conditions would allow them to do it doesn't mean they actually would. So I don't think we have any real evidence that they're moving more than 1.3 miles. Um, they could be, since it's, at that point, it's a very small percentage of the total salamanders that would be doing that, it becomes harder and harder to actually observe it. So I'm not saying it's not happening, but I don't think we can prove that anything over 1.3 miles is actually occurring. So if they're only staying within this sort of 1.3 mile range, um, is, is there any sort of like inbreeding that is going on? Because if I've, I've also heard that you know they always go back to their their natal pond to breed. I don't know if that's true or not. It's 
things I've heard. But um, the concern is if they aren't migrating as far, then how is their population really sustaining um, and there's not going to be more inbreeding over time? And also if we um, mitigate for impacts closer to the pond than further away, you know, how is that changing um, this, the genetic strength of that population? All right, well, uh, I would definitely say that a connected set of ponds that act as a metapopulation is more desirable than a single breeding pond um, for a number of reasons, but one of them would be to avoid inbreeding freshen. Um, in terms of site fidelity, so from the data set at the Hastings Natural History Reservation, they showed that 20% of the salamanders actually switched breeding ponds between consecutive years. So if there is a set of ponds close enough together that they can move between them, the salamanders will do so. And that shows that they're really acting more like a metapopulation than as each individual pond being its own single population. And so uh, you know, presumably in the past there were a lot of places where you would get these large metapopulations of ponds that were within migration distance of each other and you get salamanders moving back and forth between all of them, and thus you wouldn't have any worry about inbreeding depression. Uh, I think there's still a lot of places where that's still possible. Uh, there's probably a few sites where, you know, now it's so constrained by development that you are really looking at individual ponds acting on their own. And uh, in those cases, I don't think we really know yet if inbreeding would be a problem because in some species it seems to be a big impact and in others it doesn't and I don't think we really know why yet and uh, where California tiger salamanders fall on that spectrum is something we don't know. Uh, we have another question on WebEx that I'm going to read for you. Um, how do you think CTS knows the difference between October rains and November rains uh, when migrating to a breeding pond? And then the same person has a second question. Um, does mitigation ratio calculator take into account creating barriers between ponds? Uh, so for the first question, that is something I would love to know. Uh, that, uh, I was just discussing that with people last week, trying to figure out, you know, just coming up with hypotheses of how they might do it. So uh, one hypothesis is obviously photo period. That is the most accurate way to figure out how you know what time of year it is. Um, the problem with that is it requires going to the surface to observe photo period, and the California tiger salamanders are underground for almost all of their lives. So I don't know if you know they go to the mouth of a burrow and check. It's possible. Um, we really have no data on that. Another possibility seems to be that when we put the temperature probes into the burrow system, the temperature profile changing over the course of an entire year seemed to be pretty consistent. So they may just look at the lowering of temperatures through October and November to gauge how far through the season they're actually at. There's obviously going to be some amount of variation between that, between years based on how warm or cold they are, but I think overall, that may still be a pretty accurate way of assessing time of year. Um, what was the second part of that? Um, second part is about the mitigation ratio calculator. Does it take into account creating barriers between ponds? Oh. Um, I definitely think it should. So if you're creating a barrier that restricts uh, all the tiger salamanders from a breeding pond from reaching the land behind it, then you should be responsible for the land behind it as well. And I, uh, I wrote a paper on this, which is in conservation biology, with, that fully describes uh, how we think you should deal with that. But uh, just in the general response is yes, I do think that should be part of the calculation. Um, I wondered if you took into account, um, well, I know that you have this 95% of the population is within a certain, you know, disperses within a certain uh, distance from the pond, but 
do you think that there's some value in the individuals who are outside of the norm? You know, the um, the long distance dispersers and things like that, and maybe they are really critical to, um, long, you know, they serve some role I think that's cr maybe critical in long term survival. And yep. I just wondered if you had factored that in at all. Um, so we picked 95% because that's what most people who study migration distances do. You pick a cutoff somewhere, and that tends to be the one people go with. Um, Right. That's not to say that the salamanders that go farther than that aren't important. Um, they could be. So they could be disproportionately important relative to their percentage if they are important in these metapopulation dynamics. So if they're the ones who are most likely to maintain connectivity between ponds, then they could be more important than just the number of them doing it. Um, Again, that's something that we just don't really have data on, um, but I think it's important to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here for today and for giving us a degree talk. That's a question. The second one right here. Do you want me to? All right. It turns out we have one more online question. <laughs> All right. I'll try to read this. Statistical caution about interpreting PCA centroids as NSD. Both pure and superinvasive centroids were just outside the 95% ellipses of the other, and I have seen this interpreted as significant difference. Okay, so uh, I think I know what that is referring to. Which um, is this graph? So uh, what what the question is is that so the centroids for these two are actually just past the ninety first ninety five percent confidence interval of the you know, other treatment, and so is that statistically different or not? And um, so the way confidence intervals work is that uh, the mean does not need to fall within the 95% confidence interval of the other treatment. Um, well, the way you combine variances is actually uh, you add the, the square of the variances and take the square root. And so I've actually done that full calculation, so it's neither based on the 95% confidence intervals fully overlapping or the centroids falling within the 95% confidence level of the other treatment. I've actually done the statistical test, and they aren't uh, statistically different from each other. And Okay, now we're really done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right.